used to be addicted to stress hormones. I was a chronic overachiever, perfectionist, insomnia since I can remember. I barely slept and then when I would sleep I would have nightmares, my mind was still racing. Even when I was sleeping I was not resting. I could only work out with like really intense music blasting in my earphones to hype me up. I used to think I was like a really passionate person. Oh, I'm just passionate, but really I'm just full of rage and <laughs> emotionally reactive. I would oscillate between feeling really burnt out, but then having this restless energy. Eventually my immunity suffered, my health suffered, my hormones suffered, I was getting sick all the time. I felt overwhelmed with my life. Quitting these specific behaviors that ended up being really toxic for me was monumental for healing my nervous system. So here are five toxic behaviors I quit to heal my nervous system and get out of survival mode for good. The first toxic behavior I quit to, on my journey to heal my nervous system was multitasking. I would start making my tea then while it was heating up, I would be doing the dishes all while trying to keep an eye on my toddler and also FaceTiming my sister. I always had this feeling of like, what else can I do? What else can I get done right now? I was obsessed with being productive and I thought that when you are multitasking, you're just getting more done. It's simple math. Get more done, be more productive, feel better about yourself. That was like Jessica math. What's crazy is that we actually have research about this now, that the more tasks someone undertakes at a specific time, the more heightened their stress response is. And I was like that all the time. When I was trying to do a million things at once, that's when I would feel more forgetful. I would burn things on the stove. I was more impatient with my kid. I felt more overwhelmed. I felt more irritable. To an extent, moms are always going to multitask, especially if you have multiple kids. But the thing is, is that I was piling on a lot that didn't necessarily all need to be done at that exact moment. But in my head, I convinced myself that it actually had to. But little by little, I started unitasking. It helped me logistically begin to bring presence into my day-to-day -day life. I'm not making my hot chocolate while also trying to answer texts from a friend while also trying to unload the dishwasher. Ironically, I found that doing so would lead to me being more patient and more at peace and more productive in my day because I felt less scatterbrained. I felt more focused on the task at hand. And that also includes letting myself do nothing and be focused on doing nothing. My daughter had a moment when she was like independently playing, which was really rare and still kind of is actually. She's almost three and she's still like, she's a few years or so. I would feel the need to like, okay, I should do a million things because this is like a free moment that I could do the dishwasher and answer that text and start dinner and do a million different things. And I never allowed myself a moment to just sit outside with her, stare at the trees, sit in the sun while she plays and is happy by herself. That is a worthwhile task and is extremely restorative. Little by little, cutting down on the multitasking allowed my body to get out of survival mode because it wasn't always having to be on high alert, focusing on a million different things. And ironically, I've actually been more productive, I would say, because of it. The second toxic behavior I quit on my journey to healing my nervous system, this is a huge one, under eating and undernourishing my body. I am so passionate about this. When we under eat, whether it's overall calories, like we're not eating enough to meet our needs, we're skipping meals, you know, we're going long periods of time in between meals, we're cutting out entire macronutrients like carbs and fats, things like that. Our blood sugar is going all over the place. And when our blood sugar is all over the place, our body has to secrete high amounts of stress hormones to stabilize it. Our body can actually make its own sugar, which is really cool. It's a survival mechanism. Listen to that. It is a survival mechanism. It relies on cortisol, which is one of our main stress hormones, to do so. It can stabilize our blood sugar, but it's at a great cost to our nervous system, especially when it's done chronically. And if you're anything like me with a long history of being super entrenched in diet culture, that was my life. For like many years and the thing is is that running off of those stress hormones can feel really good until it doesn't when you crash and you feel crabby and you feel impatient and you can't sleep and you have hormonal symptoms i am a nursing mom i eat a lot of food i nourish myself and doing so over time focusing on replenishing my body feeding my body well allowed me to physiologically create that safety in my body so i have the capacity 
to rest. If you're new here or new to my work at all, I was in the realm of functional endocrinology and nutrition for many years. I'm so passionate about this. I created an entire course called The Nourished Mama that is specifically for women to replenish this postpartum and help to rebalance minerals, replenish those lost nutrient stores, and nourish their bodies well in a time when our body truly needs it and we're at the highest risk for living in survival mode. Long story short, a well-fed body is a safe body and that allows you to exit survival mode and heal your nervous system. The third toxic behavior I quit to heal my nervous system and get out of survival mode is buying into hurry culture. I'm gonna make a book recommendation. I changed my mind. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. I'll link it below. It was actually like the catalyst that started me into the slow living, minimalist movement because I was always in a hurry. That was my MO. Like I could have had that tattooed on my forehead. I graduated from college early just because I could do it faster. I power walked everywhere just because it would get me there faster. I listened to podcasts on 1.5 because then I could get it done faster. I lived my life like I was racing toward a destination, which didn't exist because whatever goalpost I had kept moving, right? It was like, when I graduate, when I get this job, when I get married, when I reach this successful milestone, I reached it and it would just move. So I was racing to get there and it was all outside of me. Like my whole life, I was just like racing to get somewhere. Finally, it hit me. It's you, Jessica. This, you're the problem. <laughs> you are the urgent one. Something he mentions in that book is that a lot of the times when he struggles to be patient, like when he finds himself being crabby at his kids, impatient with his wife, not loving people the way that God calls him to love people, a lot of times it coincides with when he's in a hurry. And that was a deep cut for me because at the time that I was reading that book, my daughter had just started walking. Talk about a girl in a hurry. This girl was like up, ready to walk at nine and a half months old. We started going on these walks and I would find myself like hurrying her along, being like, okay, like let's keep walking. I don't know why I'm doing that because we have nowhere to be. If she wants to sit and look at this ladybug for 30 minutes, let's just sit and look at this ladybug for 30 minutes. I was trying to get her to operate at my pace. And in reality, the gift of having this beautiful child that God had given me to teach me so many things. But one of them is that I actually needed to operate more on her pace. She savored. She was still. She noticed. She lived in awe. And all of those things are critical, I think, for getting out of survival mode. Finding pleasure and awe in your everyday is basically impossible when you're always in a rush. I'm not going to say it was easy. I'm not even going to say it's still easy. Like all of these toxic behaviors that I quit, I am quitting every day. I have to reorient my mindset, my heart posture every single day towards this. I even change my, the schedule of my days. Like I, if it was just a jam-packed day and I had the option to take something out, I would. So that I would not put my daughter or I or my family in a position where we felt like we were constantly rushing from day to day. The fourth thing I quit, toxic behavior for me that I quit to heal my nervous system and get out of survival mode was social media. All kinds of social media. <laughs> Seems like an extreme one, but just bear with me for a hot second. After building two separate businesses uh, through social media, various social media platforms to over like 60,000 different followers, I feel like I can actually confidently say that I've done it and tried it and really seen the damaging effects that it had on my body, mind, heart. This was actually a later one because I still bought into the pressure, especially like having been an entrepreneur for many years, that I had to have an Instagram or I had to have a TikTok. That was just what I had to do. And so this was like a, a recent, I'd say in the last year, year and a half, actually as my nervous system was like slowly regulating and I was slowly getting out of survival mode and I was starting to feel a lot better, I could notice even more when I would get on those apps, when I would engage with it, how much more obvious it was that it was not contributing to peace in my life. And it wasn't just about the content, which obviously that can be stressful, right? You're getting so much news, you're getting so much information, you're getting such so many images even that your brain has to process through. And I personally don't believe that we were created to have access to all that information at once. So it wasn't just the content. It wasn't just me curating, you know, like who I follow so that it wasn't fear-driven, anxiety-driven. 
it was even just being on the apps, the rate at which I was flipping through, the fact that the content was 60 seconds and done, everything was really fast paced. I would just exit even after like 20 minutes and just feel like my brain was staticky. That's how I can explain it. My brain was staticky. I felt on defense. I felt on, I felt like I was in survival mode, quite frankly, honestly. And for me personally, it was actually just a relief to get rid of it completely. I have a small personal Instagram where literally only my friends and family follow me and I post pictures of my kid, people that live far away, and that's it. I don't access it. And even then, I'm, I pretty much only access it actually on my computer once every one to two weeks. And it is a relief. The fifth and last one is being a clutter queen. I quit being a clutter queen. You know, if you walk into my house, you would not be like, hmm, this girl's really minimalist. I don't have all white furniture. I don't have a lot of house plants. I actually would love that, but the truth is that I cannot, for the life of me, keep them alive. So I don't have like bare countertops everywhere. And that's what I think is so beautiful about minimalism, or at least my entry point into it, my understanding of it, is that it really is just about being extremely intentional about your space because what I came to realize is that my home has the potential to be my safe space from the world it should be like a haven of sorts and it wasn't until I became a mom that I found my capacity for what I could handle was less because I was kind of outputting into this child constantly and it really began to weigh on me how much stuff we had managing the space of my home not feeling like my home was a source of rest and peace for me, but it was actually a source of stress. And I think a lot of us, especially in America, we underestimate that. Is your home a source of stress or is it a source of peace? I also feel like I've definitely heard, don't quote me on this, but I'm fairly certain, the study about clutter raising cortisol in women, I feel like this just explains so much about my mom. I held on to so much stuff because of guilt, because I felt like, oh, we spent money on it for just in case, for kind of catastrophizing for the future, I should have access to this, you name it, I held on to it. And it actually started with me decluttering my closet. I can't explain why, but I had this innate need, like six months postpartum, that I had to massively minimize my closet. I went from a closet of over a thousand pieces to a 10 item wardrobe, which sounds extreme. <laughs> I'm actually gonna make a video on it. I know that sounds crazy, but it was the catalyst for me going through my whole home and intentionally creating a space that felt more ease, felt more peaceful. Besides it being more manageable to clean and take care of, I actually found that it was the emotional work of getting rid of all of these things and denying myself the impulse buys that was where the magic happened. As I was decluttering things like my closet, I was getting rid of old identities, old lies, um, old hurts that I had held on to. I mean, it was kind of crazy how much manipulating my physical space impacted my internal space. It's still in progress, but the intention of when I buy things, how I buy things, how I store things is radically different and has allowed me to physically in my space create safety, and ease and it has allowed a physical container for me to heal if you have found any of these behaviors to be unhealthy or toxic for you and given anything to chew on let me know in the comments below i would love it especially if you have new ones that maybe are specific to you i'd love to hear it. i am jess and i make videos about intentionally cultivating contentment in motherhood through things like slow living minimalism holistic health subscribe if you're into that i'd love to see you and i'll see you in the next video